Hello. Today's reflection as we try to stay connected as a parish is going to be a Bible study. Today we will reflect on scripture readings for the next Sunday, March 29th. The first reading and the gospel will be listed below this video and you may want to refer to them as we do our study today. Our purpose is to prepare ourselves to hear the word of God when it's proclaimed in a way that the words can be transformative. The readings are way too familiar sometimes and sometimes we tune them out. By studying them ahead of time, we might be able to hear them with new ears, have a greater insight because God is working. What I'd like to do today is shed a little light on the background of the Gospel of John, go through the Gospel itself with some comments, offer some of my reflections, and invite you to have your own. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all righteousness, send your Spirit into our minds and hearts so we may understand your word and live its truth. Amen. John's Gospel was written around the year 90 to 100, and it was the last Gospel to be written. It's quite different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Gospel writer emphasized the divinity of Christ. He wanted also to emphasize that Jesus was the Messiah and had power over death and life, light over darkness. And the author wanted it to be believed that all Christian belief was in Jesus Christ. On Sunday, we will hear the familiar story of the raising of Lazarus. This is the longest story in the Gospel of John except for the Passion it is the last of seven miracle stories, like Cana, the healing of the Roman servants, and the cure of the blind man, for instance. This story about a dead man brought back to life will lead Jesus into the passion and death. It is not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And since today is a study, I want you to invite you to look at the gospel. Either you have it uh, at home already or it's at the bottom of your screen. And as I talk, to write down your thoughts or just listen with an open heart. I'm reading the shortened version of the gospel, which is an option to be read in church. The sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. Jesus knew well Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus. There are times when he visited their home in Bethany, and they're having trouble right now, and they sent word to him. The ones that went to Jesus called him Master, a, a word of deference. They said, the one you love is ill. It's kind of interesting that the crowds, the messengers knew that Jesus had love for Lazarus. When Jesus heard this, he said, this illness is not to end in death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Back this up a little bit. The disciples at the time didn't understand this, and they tried to argue with Jesus a little bit. But what Jesus was referring to was spiritual death. And just like in the first reading, he would be raised to glorify God. Now, Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. Again, note that Jesus had compassion and love, probably tenderness, towards this family. So when he heard that he was ill, 
he remained for two days in the place where he was. Now that's really odd. He, needed, he was needed someplace, and he stayed away for two days. Scripture scholars don't exactly have a good explanation for that, that he would remain away when he was needed so much. Some say possibly just to prove that Lazarus was really dead. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Martha will have a word to say about that later. Then, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Judea was a dangerous place where Jesus had been threatened with stoning not long before this. When he said, let's go back to Judea, he walked back into the fire. He actually was moving towards the cross by choice. He made the choice to do that. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Interesting number, four days. In the rabbinic tradition of the time, the spiritual beliefs, they believed that the departed hovered, or the spirit of the departed hovered over the body for four days, or for three days. So by the fourth day, they were surely dead. So surely Lazarus was really dead. When Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Can you imagine how Martha felt when she heard that he was coming? She had a whole bunch of people at her house. There was great sadness at their house. Jesus had waited two days to come, and she heard that he was coming. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She was disappointed. It was almost reproachful. Can you not imagine her looking at Jesus going, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. But think about it for just a moment. When she spoke to Jesus with those words, it showed that she had a comfort level with Jesus, a trust, a belief that she wouldn't be talked down or yelled at, but to speak her own sadness, her own frustration. You and I have been there before. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Underneath her frustration, which was real and deserved being spoken, she knew she had faith and it was there. Notice as we continue the reading that it's a back and forth communication between Jesus and the sisters and the disciples, back and forth, back and forth. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said, I know he will rise in the re resurrection on the last day. It was a belief that there would be a final resurrection but that didn't really help her brother at this time. So Jesus continued. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. The word I am, the title I am, the name I am, was an Old Testament name for God, which continued through the Gospels for Jesus at times. It kind of means I am God, I am with you. I am here. I am all things to all people. He completes this one with, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's look at the word life for just a minute. In the Gospel of John, it's used 36 times. And it applies to life, not just eternal life, although that is also used but it also talks about life as being present. Jesus is the one who has power over life and death. And he continues, whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. It is about life in the world right now, where Jesus also offers life. And then Jesus said to her, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. 
I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. In that very brief beginning in that sentence, I have come to believe. All of us are on a faith journey. We come to believe. We have certain beliefs and we grow. It's like in any relationship. The titles that she gives him, the Christ and the Son of God, are really a summary of some of the other titles that were given to Jesus in John. Later on in the same gospel, her sister will say the same thing, but her sister, unlike Martha on her feet going towards Jesus, her sister will be kneeling at the feet of Jesus, but she will say the same words. There's a line missing in the second, uh, or in the uh, um, shortened version, and it's this. When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the crowd of mourners, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, uh, that word perturbed in Greek, I read in a commentary, means he snorted in spirit. In other words, he was really upset and troubled. Scripture scholars ask, why was he perturbed and deeply troubled? Was it because people didn't believe him? Was it because he was caught up in the chaos of this mourning and this dip, disbelief and this tension? But uh, nonetheless, he became perturbed and deeply troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, sir, come and see. Notice they call him sir. It's not a divine title, sign of respect, but you know, sir, come and see. The next line is one of the shortest sentences, if not the shortest sentence in the Bible. It says, and Jesus wept. Sometimes that's the only thing God can do with us. That's the only thing that Jesus can do with us. When life is very difficult, he can weep with us. In 1995, during the Oklahoma City bomb, bombing, or the, the days after, there was a picture uh, sent around uh, on the internet, I imagine, of Jesus weeping. And I heard a commentator say, that's all we can do right now because there is no justification for this, there's nothing we can do to change it, and Jesus wept. So the Jews, the other people of God, saw this, and they noticed, they said, see how he loved him? There's that love again that Jesus was known for, that people could easily say that. They didn't say he was such a great teacher, I'm talking about the Gospel of John right now, they didn't say that he was even a miracle worker. They said, see how he loved them? Jesus in the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of John, often revealed an intimacy of love and caring and compassion for his disciples and his followers. But some of them said, th these are the, the people that wanted better statistics, said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So <clears throat> Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. That really paints a picture, doesn't it? Uh, he's really dead. And there's practical Martha, the doer, who said, you know, you may want to think twice about this, Lord, because it's not going to be pretty when you open that grave. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Notice that the people are involved in this process. There are helpers who are helping in this process. We have helpers around us now during this very critical time. We need to look for them, like Mr. Rogers said. So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said this very brief prayer, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. 
What a beautiful, short prayer. Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But he said, because of the crowd here, I have said this, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. This was not a resurrection, it was a resuscitation. At Jesus' resurrection, we will remember from the story, the burial cloths laid on the stones, but notice Lazarus is still tied hand and foot with the burial bands. So Jesus said, untie him and let him go. Again, Jesus directs the people to help. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe him. They came to a faith. That's the gospel, the shortened version, and perhaps in the reading uh, or the listening of it right now, already a thought or a word has come to your mind that has touched you or inspired you or made you think. Or maybe later on when this video is over and you have time to prepare for Sunday, you can reread that reading and see where God touches your heart now that you know just a little more about it. There are two things I would like to comment on that struck me in this reading. But as always, I would just say that they struck me this time. Maybe at a second reading, something else would strike me. So know that whatever it is you and I heard, that is for right now. But I would like to share these. The first is the uh, mention of Lazarus and the burial cloths. Those are symbolic or can be seen as symbolic they are symbolic to us for those of us that might be bound by fear, anxiety, or sin. We are bound by something that is not life-giving. We can ask ourselves, what do we need to be free? Jesus offers life. Je Jesus offers people in our lives to help with that. Are we letting isolation bring us down when good self-care and perhaps the help, help of others would help us. We need each other. During this time, we need to be creative in how we uh, respond to those needs. Good mental health practices are the best medicine sometimes. Or perhaps, are we bound by um, things that we had planned to do at the beginning of Lent, and we're halfway through Lent, and we found that we have abandoned that because we've now so busy with the coronavirus. Maybe we need to refocus on where we began. Or maybe we need to redo those practices of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving where we are called to act now. Certainly our prayer is different. Certainly fasting is different. Giving up chocolate is hard enough. Giving up the Eucharist, giving up social connections, that's hard, that's fasting. And almsgiving, we might have had some idea about what we would do with that, but now there are people who need our time and our effort through social media, through a phone call, through a letter, who need to hear from us, to give of our time and our talents. Are there issues that we were once really concerned about that no longer have significance? Can we let them go? Can we let them go? The other thing I wanted to comment on was Martha's statement. Lord, had you just been here? We might all be asking that right now, but God is present. Our faith tells us that he is. Our God is Emmanuel. It is God's grace that will give us hope. He may not change things, but God can change us. 
In the end, Jesus, who is the resurrection and life, calls us to choose life, and he will give it just as he did to Lazarus. Where we can, look at our prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Choose life. Choose life, as Deuteronomy says, so that you and your families, your posterity, will have life. And know that God's grace will work with us and through us. As we reflect on the Gospel reading and the others that you may be looking at um, as you prepare for Mass, we can ask God to open our hearts to his transforming word, that his word can change our lives and the lives of others we meet. If today you hear God's voice, harden not your hearts. May the Lord bless us and keep us. Thank you.